طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعده so I would say officially officially this is the first uh, segment in this series which we named a thematic commentary on the Quran it's a thematic commentary on the Quran and this will try to basically detect something or seek something which is the seamless flow of the divine wisdom in the words of the Quran we said the Quran is internally consistent very interconnected and uh, at a shallow kind of approach or reading the Quran might be challenging because it might seem to be random in its presentation of certain ideas and treatment of certain uh, issues but there is a beautiful flow but it does not yield itself easily and we said it requires a lot of investment in order to arrive at that so since we spoke last week I've been putting a lot of thought in this and um, I actually thought to do something that I believe will be very useful we said we will start taking uh, or dealing with the surahs of the Quran right from the beginning from Surah Al-Fatiha, Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran and so on and so forth to Surah Al-Nas and I thought just to um, which is the classical way and I thought let's do it slightly different this time and what we're gonna do we're gonna actually take two rounds with the Quran first round we're gonna take a very short quick overview over the main themes or the central themes of every surah so probably in two three segments we'll be able to cover the whole Quran so we'll go from Surah Al-Fatiha to Surah Al-Nas just mentioning the surah the central theme or what we believe to be the foundational verse in it that all the other verses basically uh, stem from it and feed back into it at the same time so this should give us quite a like a good overview uh, into the surahs and what their main themes are uh, just a reference the scholars of the of the past did not write exclusively or specifically on this topic the themes of the Quran the themes of the source but you will find a lot of segments in the books of tafsir specifically you will find in um, in tafsir al-tabari you'll find a lot of hints and a lot of side notes about issues like this You'll find them finding the tafsir of the Fayruz Aba of Al Fayruz Abadi as well, one of the scholars of language and tafsir. He also has a lot of beautiful hints. You will find uh, someone who is slight, or cons considered him to be contemporary. He's from the 20th century, the famous Tunisian uh, mufassir and scholar of uh, of the Maqasid, Al Tahir ibn Ashur. Tahir ibn Ashur has a beautiful, powerful tafsir of the Quran, which is called the Tahrir wa Tanweer. It's a very profound tafsir. And every student of knowledge should have access to this book, should read through this book. It's quite enlightening. It's actually, it's a game changer for those who study tafsir. So there are hints, but uh, as I said, the majority of the older scholars, the classical scholars, uh, scholars avo did not write about this. They went into each verse, broke it down, spoke linguistically, from a fiqh perspective, uh, from a uh, usul al-fiqh perspective, uh, and historical, sometimes uh, treating things historically or chronologically, and so on and so forth. But uh, to have something completely on what the scholars, these scholars called, used to call so what we call the central theme of a surah which is in Arabic or which is the unity of the theme in a surah is called by the classical scholars or the main intent behind the surah which is the theme the main theme behind the surah and if you remember those who were with us last last week we said one of the scholars who really attempted to do a great job with this is Al Imam Al Biqai, right? Anyone recalls the name of his book? Jam'ud Durar, right? 
جمع الدرر في تناسب الآيات أو نظم الدرر في تناسب الآيات والسور basically piecing together these uh, precious stones or the gems which are uh, basically how the verses and the surahs connect together he has another book which is a smaller book so this book is about eight I think eight or nine volumes the one we, which is Nadhma al he has another book which is more of a shorter version of this and it's called Tasaeed uh, al-Nadhar fi al-Ishrafi ala maqasid al-Suwar he says looking from above like getting a, a, a vintage point good vintage point over the intents of the surahs and he actually makes a segment or a section for each surah chapter of each surah the number of the verses the main theme of the verse and then he moves to talk about the merits of the verse and then he explains a little bit for about let's say 15 20 pages of the longer surah like surah, surahs like al-baqarah and ali imran with the shorter surahs obviously is shorter and then he moves on so it's quite systematic it's not like his bigger version the bigger book which is very detailed so we're going to use it and I, I'll I have to you know I have to be clear from now this is a learning process even for me so I'm going through a process of learning and I'm sharing with you I've been for, for, for I've been there quite for quite some time and I've been struggling with Imam al-Baqai he's not easy to deal with like sometimes I can't see his point how he picks this to be ma- the main theme of the surah it really doesn't make sense to me but this is one of the great scholars of tafsir and language uh, and again you have scholars we have contemporary scholars um, uh, like uh, Sheikh Dr. Musaad al-Tayyar anyone heard of Dr. Musaad al-Tayyar? so anyone today who study, studies the science of the Quran ulum al-Quran the classical book the standard book the standard text book on this is written by Dr. Musaad al-Tayyar Every student of knowledge who studies the ulum al-Qur'an, the sciences of the Qur'an, they have to study his book. It, it is like it is the default textbook for any student of knowledge who has to study this. So he says that trying to find the main theme of a surah and for every surah, he says, قَدْ لَا يَخْلُوا ذَلِكَ مِنَ التَّكَلُّفِ He says sometimes this is going too far. Because sometimes it's not easy to find something like this. Then he says, وَفِيهِ مَزَلَّةُ الْقَوْلِ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمِ And there, it's a slippery road. Because a person might say something about Allah or about the book of Allah, which is not necessarily accurate. Okay? So as we are talking about these things, we have to clarify right from the outset. These are attempts of scholars. These are ways to see how the ideas connect together. So this is a human effort. It is a human effort. But is it helpful? Extremely helpful. When it brings the surah together for you in one unity, it makes it easier for you to read through it, to enjoy it, to see the connections because our minds or brains work on connections. If things are not connected, they're not relevant. So these kind of connections, they help you with understanding and comprehension and they help you most importantly with memorization. Her father of the Quran, by the way, some of them, they create mind maps of how the themes connect and when transitions happen from one theme to the other it helps them when they when they rehearse that often it it, it makes their memorization more stable because they have a map as the where, where where they're moving um and um you also find for example dr musaad al-tayyar speaks about he says the verses of the quran with the shorter ones, Qisar al-Suwar, the shorter, like in Juz Amma, Surah Al-Nas, Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Samad, Surah Al-Kafirun, he says most of the shorter surahs, they have one theme, one single theme. The whole surah is about one theme. Like for example, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, Surah Al-Samad. And the theme of, of Al-Samad is Al-Ikhlas, Al-Tawheed which is sincerity to Allah, singling out Allah with our intentions and our actions. And he says, then with the longer surahs, which are longer than that, and the longest surahs, some of the, I would say, slightly long surahs, they have also one theme, some of them. An example is Surah Al-Naba' Amma Yitasa'alun. Surah Al-Naba' has one theme, treats one theme, 
And this is Al-Ba'ath, resurrection, the next life. It's all about this. There are supporting themes, but it's completely about one theme. But then he says the longest surahs have more than one theme. Have more than one theme. But it's not difficult, even for those longest surahs, to actually bring the pull these strings together and bring them, connect the dots in a way where you can find all of these themes that a surah seem, seems to be dealing with fragmentally, they actually connect to one theme. And that's what we will try to do here in this class, insha'Allah ta'ala. Uh, again, I'm happy to see some, some of you have the notebooks, some of you have the translation of the Quran, some of you have the notepads or whatever. And I'm assuming if you have your tablet or your notepad that you actually have, <laughs> have a text to look at or you're taking notes. <laughs> As I said, it will be extremely helpful. This class will be helpful for those who want an opportunity to go over the tafsir of the Quran. This class will help uh, to serve as a pacer for them. So they can pace their reading as they follow with us. They can follow with us and they can do their reading. And I, and I recommended that you either follow Tafsir ibn Kathir. It's available in English, which is uh, the abridged version. is available in English. The, the Tafsir ibn Kathir that's in English is not the full version, by the way. It's an abridgment. Um, or Tafsir al-Sa'di, which I believe came out last year or two years ago, which is extremely valuable and beautiful and um, if anyone wants an English uh, source um, there is a book by Sheikh Muhammad Al-Ghazali Rahimahullah Ta'ala it's called in Arabic Nahwa Tafsir in Mawdu'iyin Lil Quran towards a thematic understanding of the Quran it's, it's a one volume book and it's been translated into English and the translation sometimes is better than the original text. This is one of the rare occasions where you find a translator actually does more than justice to the original text. Uh, I'll get you the name of the, uh, of the translation. I'll get you the name of the translation. And I believe it's available online of the book. But if you put Muhammad al-Ghazali, thematic tafsir or thematic, thematic tafsir, you're going to find it. The English translation is, although Sheikh Muhammad al-Ghazali is extremely eloquent, he writes so beautifully, one of the best styles of our time, in my personal assessment. He's not only, he wasn't only a faqih, but he was also a, an excellent writer. And he wrote so many books, more than a hundred books. Um, so, but the translator has written the book in English in a way that I would say even like supersedes the original book in Arabic. So. So that's helpful. So again, anyone who wants to do their own tafsir, I definitely recommend that they use this class as a pacer. It will help them. Because when you read on your own, it's easy to sometimes, you know, put off and uh, postpone and sometimes get distracted. But if there is uh, some kind of a halaqa or some kind of a, a structure that helps you keep up with, I think that will, that will be a good a, a good, assi uh, good, assi good assistance, insha'Allah. So again, another another thing. So as we will be doing this with with the Quran, which is a thematic commentary on the Quran, I will be going over a small book uh, written by Sheikh Abdul Rahman Al Saadi. Sheikh Abdul Rahman Al Saadi is the teacher of Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahumullah. Okay, he wrote a beautiful, simple book, easy book, on some of the principles on tafsir the principles that will help us uh, you know interpret the Quran these are the foundational principles of the ex exegesis of the Quran the tafsir of the Quran and they're extremely important and helpful and um, I'm gonna actually use the commentary on that text which is a very short commentary from his own student Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen so if you if you have access to the Arabic language, uh, probably it's probably translated into English. Is it translated into English? Anyone has come across this? Uh, I think it's been translated into English. Ibn Sa'di's Principles of Tafsir. I think they have been translated into English. Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen uh, made a, s a very short commentary on it and he calls it At-Ta'liq ala al-Qawa'id al-Hisan al-Muta'alliqa bi Tafsir al-Quran. التعليق على commentary on القواعد الحسان the beautiful principles or the beautiful maxims uh, relating to the tafsir of the Quran 
So the class will be made of two segments. I'm not gonna probably get, spend 10 minutes on this. I will read and translate into English and make very short commentary. And our main class, our main halqa will be on our uh, discussion on the thematic commentary on the Quran. So I will start with the principles of tafsir, insha'Allah ta'ala. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال المؤلف فضيلة الشيخ العلامة عبد الرحمن بن ناصر السعدي رحمه الله تعالى في مقدمة كتابه القواعد الحسان المتعلقة بتفسير القرآن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد So this says that uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman bin Saidi says in the introduction to his book which is titled The Beautiful Maxims Relating to the Tafsir of the Quran He praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he mentions khutbat al hajah and he says, فهذه أصول وقواعد في تفسير القرآن الكريم جليلة المقدار عظيمة النفع تعين قارئها ومتأملها على فهم كلام الله والاهتداء به ومخبرها أجل من وصفها فإنها تفتح للعبد من طرق التفسير ومنهاج الفهم عن الله ما يعين على كثير من التفاسير الحالية في هذه البحوث النافعة. He says, these are principles and maxims about the tafsir on the noble Qur'an they are great in their value and their benefit is huge they help the one who reads them and contemplates them these rules to understand the words of Allah and to be guided by them and the reality of these principles is far more profound than their wordings because these principles, they open for the person the uh, paths to tafsir and provide, and, and provide him with a methodology and a structure to understand from the words of Allah what will be very beneficial in understanding the books of tafsir. أَرْجُوا اللَّهَ وَأَسْأَلُهُ أَنْ يَتِمَّ مَا قَصَدْنَا مِنْ إِرَادِهِ أن يتم ما قصدنا إراده ويفتح لنا من خزائن جوده وكرمه ما يكون سببا للوصول إلى العلم النافع والهدى الكامل He says when we ask Allah that Allah completes for us and fulfills for us our intention behind this and the reason behind this book and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower on us or to shower us with his blessings and his generosity and to give us whatever will be a reason for us or a means for us to attain beneficial knowledge and complete guidance. وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ عِلْمَ التَّفْسِيرِ أَجَلُّ الْعُلُومِ عَلَى الْإِطْلَاقِ وَأَفْضَلُهَا وَأَوْجَبُهَا وَأَحَبُّهَا إِلَى اللَّهِ لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ أَمَرَ بِتَدَبُّرِ كِتَابِهِ وَالتَّفَكُّرِ فِي مَعَانِيهِ وَالِاهْتِدَاءِ بِآيَاتِهِ وَأَثْنَى عَلَى الْقَائِمِينَ بِذَلِكَ وَجَعَلَهُمْ فِي أَعْلَى الْمَرَاتِبِ وَوَعَدَهُمْ أَسْنَى الْمَوَاهِبِ He's saying and know that the science of tafsir is the highest of all sciences and it is the best and the most obligatory and the one that Allah loves the most because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to contemplate his book and to try to understand its meanings and to take guidance from its verses and Allah praised the ones who engage in that effort and Allah made them in the highest ranks and Allah promised them the highest rewards. فَلَوْ أَنْفَقَ الْعَبْدُ جَوَاهِرَ عُمُرِهِ فِي هَذَا الْفَنِّ لَمْ يَكُنْ ذَلِكَ كَثِيرًا فِي جَنْبِ مَا هُوَ أَفْضَلُ الْمَطَالِبِ وَأَعْظَمُ الْمَقَاصِدِ وَأَصْلُ الْأُصُولِ كُلِّهَا وَقَاعِدَةُ أَسَاسَاتِ الدِّينِ وَصَلَاحُ أُمُورِ الدِّينِ وَالدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَكَانَتْ حَيَاةُ الْعَبْدِ زَاهِرَةً بِالْهُدَى وَالْخَيْرِ وَالرَّحْمَةِ وَطِيبِ الْحَيَاةِ وَالْبَاقِيَاتِ الصَّالِحَاتِ He's saying, he's saying, so if a person spends his own life, his whole life and the most precious, you know, periods of his life studying this science, this would not be too much. Because of the, due to the, the, the virtue and the merit of this science, uh, which is the greatest of all endeavors, and it's the principle of all principles. 
and it is the foundation of the pillars of the deen and it is a means to rectifying the matters of the deen and the dunya and the akhirah and if a person follows it then a person's life would be full with guidance goodness and mercy and a goodly life and righteous deeds فلنشرع الآن بذكر القواعد والضوابط على وجه الإيجاز الذي يحصل به المقصود لأنه إذا فتح للعبد الباب وتمهدت عنده القاعدة وتدرب منها بعدة أمثلة توضحها وتبين طريقها ومنهجها لم يحتج إلى زيادة البسط وكثرة التفاصيل ونسأله أن يمدنا بعونه ولطفه وتوفيقه وأن يجعلنا هادين مهتدين بمنه وكرمه He's saying let's get into the uh, principles uh, in a way that that is characterized by brevity it's brief is brief so he's saying is we're not going to expound we're not going to go into great lengths uh, he's saying we're just gonna mention what is beneficial be to the point because if Allah opens the door of knowledge for someone and Allah facilitates the way for a person to learn and a person takes a few examples the ap or applications of the rule uh, and the person figures out the methodology then there is no need for more explanation and for wasting time with more elaboration and he says we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us with his support and assistance and his blessings and we ask Allah to make us from those who are guided and those who are guiding others now I, I won't necessarily read everything Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen says because it's not, these words don't need a lot of clarification but Shaykh Ibn Uthameen says كان ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه يقول لو أعلم أن أحدا تناله الإبل أعلم بكتاب الله مني لرحلت إليه ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه used to say if I know someone knows more about the book of Allah more than me and like camels reach him basically I have access to that person I would travel and go to that person and that shows that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud had a keen desire to learn more about the Qur'an although he was the most knowledgeable of the Qur'an among like generally speaking among the companions because he asked the Prophet ﷺ about everything in the Qur'an so he says if I find someone who knows more I would travel to them Al-Qa'idatul <coughs> Ula the first rule or the first principle he says, كل من سلك طريقا وعمل عملا وأتاه من أبوابه وطرقه الموصلة إليه فلا بد أن يفلح وينجح كما قال تعالى وأتوا البيوت من أبوابها. He's saying whoever follows or takes a way or a path or does something, does a, a certain deed and approaches it in the right way, approaches this thing in the right way through the right gates then this person is bound to arrive and get what they seek as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and enter the houses through their doors through the doors he's saying and whenever what you're seeking is is great then this advice to follow the right path to take the right means to everything it becomes more incumbent and becomes more necessary uh, because such ways will help you uh, complete your research in the best ways and will make you arrive at your destination make you get what you want and he's saying there's no doubt that what we are engaged with now which is tafsir and the principles of tafsir is one of the loftiest and, and most important things فَعَلَمْ أَنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ الْعَظِيمُ أَنْزَلَهُ اللَّهُ لِهِدَايَةِ الْخَلْقِ وَإِرْشَادِهِمْ وَأَنَّهُ فِي كُلِّ وَقْتٍ وَزَمَانٍ يُرْشِدُ إِلَىٰ أَهْدَ الْأُمُورِ وَأَقْوَمِهَا إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ He says know that this uh, glorious Quran was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guiding the creation and showing them the way and that in every place and at every time it leads to the most guided of ways and the most straight of paths 
إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوى as in سورة الإسراء this Quran indeed leads to the most straight فعلى الناس أن يتلقوا معنى كلام الله كما تلقاه الصحابة رضي الله عنهم فإنهم كانوا إذا قرأوا عشر آيات أو أقل أو أكثر لم يتجاوزوها حتى يعرفوا ما دلت عليه من الإيمان والعلم والعمل فينزلونها على الأحوال الواقعة saying people have to uh, learn the meanings of the words of Allah just like the companions did رضي الله عنهم they used to recite or read or learn ten verses at a time and they would not go beyond that. They will not move on to another set of 10 verses until they have uh, learned whatever these verses indicate in terms of faith, Iman, or in terms of knowledge and information, and in terms of action. And they would use these verses to understand their present reality and their conditions. فيعتقدون ما احتوت عليه من الأخبار وينقادون لأوامرها ونواهيها ويدخلون فيها جميع ما يشهدون من الحوادث والوقائع الموجودة بهم وبغيرهم So they would believe in everything the Quran says, the words of the Quran say, like the news about previous nations, about matters of the unseen, about Allah, about the day of judgment. They would believe in everything they told. And uh, they would follow all the uh, commandments and avoid all the prohibitions. And they would frame their reality and whatever incident, incidents happen in their life, they would frame that with the words of the Quran. So they would, s so the Quran, the words of the Quran become, become the lens through which they understand reality. Can someone uh, deal with the... <coughs> ويحاسبون أنفسهم هل هم قائمون بها أو مخلون and they would hold themselves accountable are they upholding these words of the Quran and staying true to them or are they falling short or are they not giving them their rights وكيف الطريق إلى الثبات على الأمور النافعة وإيجاد ما نقص منها وكيف التخلص من الأمور الضارة and they would also seek the ways to remain steadfast and consistent on the things that are beneficial and see whatever they, where, wherever they have a deficiency they would make it up and fix it and they would find ways to get rid of the harmful things فَيَحْتَدُونَ بِعُلُومِهِ وَيَتَخَلَّقُونَ بِإِخْلَاقِهِ وَآدَابِهِ So they would be guided by the knowledge and the information in the Qur'an and they would seek to embody the character that is preached in the Qur'an and the etiquettes that are taught in the Qur'an. وَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ خِطَابٌ مِنْ عَالِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ مُوَجَّهٌ إِلَيْهِمْ وَمُطَالَبُونَ بِمَعْرِفَةِ مَعَانِيهِ وَالْعَمَلِ بِمَا يَقْتَضِيهِ So they they know that this is, these are words addressed to them from the one who knows the seen and the unseen and that they are required to understand its meanings and to act upon its guidance. فَمَنْ سَلَكَ هَذَا الطَّرِيقَ الَّذِي سَلَكُوهُ وَجَدَّ وَاجْتَهَدَ فِي تَدَبُّرِ كَلَامِ اللَّهِ إِنْ فَتَحَ لَهُ الْبَابُ الْأَعْظَمُ فِي عِلْمِ التَّفْسِيرِ وَقَوِيَتْ مَعْرِفَتُهُ وَازْدَادَتْ Basiratuhu. He's saying, so whoever follows this way, which was taken by the companions, and worked hard and exerted themselves in reflecting on the words of Allah, then the, the biggest door or the greatest door to tafsir will open to that person. And their knowledge will strengthen and their insight, meaning in the Qur'an, into the Qur'an, the meanings of the Qur'an, will, will grow. 
واستغنى بهذه الطريقة عن كثرة التكلفات وعن البحوث الخارجية وخصوصا إذا كان قد أخذ من علوم العربية جانبا قويا وكان له إلمام واهتمام بسيرة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأحواله مع أوليائه وأعدائه فإن ذلك أكبر عون على هذا المطلب He's saying So a person who does that follows the way of the companion the, the way of the companions رضي الله عنهم it would suffice him it would be enough for him and it would save him from getting into issues of great technicality that have little benefit and uh, issues that serve as distractions some discu- discussions that serve as distractions and sometimes you read in a book and sometimes you know it, the writer or the author flies off at a tangent right they start to they take a digression they start expounding on something and then you lose the you know the the consistency of thoughts and the continuity of your of the ideas so he's saying if you take the ways of the, the way of the companions in understanding the tafsir and reflecting on the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you don't need a lot of the technicality that will just serve to distract you and t- is more of a digression and he says especially if this person has taken a good share or a fair share of the knowledge of the Arabic language and that person had a good fair understanding a comprehensive a comprehensive understanding of the seerah or the life of the Prophet Sallallahu and how he dealt on his like his his affairs and how he dealt with his companions and friends and how he dealt with his enemies he's saying all of these elements help you understand the Quran and he says ومتى علم العبد أن القرآن فيه تبيان كل شيء وأنه كفيل بجميع المصالح مبين لها حاث عليها زاجر عن المضار كلها وجعل هذه القاعدة نصب عينيه ونزلها على كل واقع وحادث سابق أو لاحق ظهر ظهر له عظم موقعها وكثرة فوائدها وثمرتها he's saying and whenever the person knows that the Quran contains guidance about everything Quran gives you answers about everything and that the Quran is enough to cover all of all of the sources of benefit all of the masalih and it clarifies them and the means to them and it actually encourages the Quran encourages to get the beneficial things and it advises against the bad things and whoever keeps this principle in front of them like their guide keep it as their guide and which is basically the Quran is enough for everything that's the principle he's talking about the Quran is sufficient it has the guidance then whoever has this uh, principle uh, as their guide and they try to apply it on every situation whether present or even future or expected then the enormity and the potential of this principle will start to reveal itself and the benefits of it will reveal themselves why because once you are under the impression that the quran does not present answers you're not going to invest in it if you are under the impression that the quran does not answer contemporary issues you're not going to invest in it you're going to go to youtube right or you'll go to uh, any any kind of website you know wikipedia or you'll go to anything to find answers or you'll go to experts but if you are if you have the belief if you have the certainty that the quran has guidance for everything then you will invest in the quran you start to search for the answers in the quran and oftentimes some you know there's a i would say a naive question or an obnoxious question comes about okay what does the quran say about you know iphone x10 right or whatever or, or Galaxy S10, right? <laughs> Whatever. Okay, this is a naive question. Because the Quran gives guidance about the most important issues about life. Because five years from now, you probably won't have a Galaxy X10, right? It would be history. The Quran deals with the bigger issues. And even the Quran tells you how to deal with your phone, by the way. And even tells you what phone to buy but you need to invest it does tell you but because we said if you remember last week we said the Quran does not only give direct 
guidance, immediate guidance about things. Do this, do that. The Quran builds a reservoir of wisdom within you if you invest in it, which builds a background, a very powerful framework or background for you and uh, a worldview that will help you navigate almost every aspect in your life. Almost every aspect in your life. I'll give you an example, very simple example. <coughs> Allah SWT says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. Let's say you, wanna, you, you got interested into, in photography. You want to learn how to start shooting and taking photographs and imagery and the cameras and all these, you know, all, all the ins and, and outs of, of, of photography as, 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 a, as, a, as a profession. You will know about that. Does the Quran tell you anything about this? It does. It gives you the guidance. It says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. And the people of knowledge is not like your, your classmate because they have a couple of cameras. It's not someone who knows a little bit more than you do about, about photography. You go to the people of knowledge. You go, who's the highest authority? Who are, like for, you can go online here, right? Who, who has the best online course on photography? Who's, offering, who's in town offering the best kind of training on photography? You go and take that. So the Quran does give you guidance about all of this. So again, sometimes a, a person is shallow in their understanding and they want to sort of ask questions and think, hey, like, okay, the Quran doesn't give you guidance about every, everything. Well, I mean, sorry, if, if that's how you understand things, then see you maybe in 20 years. Hopefully you'll be a little bit more mature, hopefully. Uh, okay, so so this is the first principle, which is basic. Oh, and and what I find here is to be two. So first, following the way of the companions and understanding of the Quran, which is take the Quran ten verses or another narration five verses at a time, and reflect upon them, learn whatever is in them, and try to implement them, and try to see the world through them. Dig out the wisdoms, dig out the knowledge. And that, you can't get that by, I mean, a book of tafsir and a commentary or a class on tafsir can give you the basics about this. But for you to see your life through the verses of the Quran, what does that mean? It means you have to take time out of your schedule. You have to hold the book of Allah in your hands. You have to take these five verses and you have to read them repeatedly and reflect upon them and ask yourself questions not at a superficial level but at the, at the deep profound level that basically has to do with the meaning of your life what does that tell me how can i benefit from this how does this relate to my life how does this relate to my situation you tr you take it personally you take the quran at a personal level if you start doing that then that's the way you, that's the way of the companions right and the second thing he said, keep in mind that the Qur'an has guidance about everything you truly need. The Qur'an has guidance. So you believe in this is a principle. وَأَنزَلْنَا الْكِتَابَ تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And we have revealed the book. Uh, it clarifies everything. And everything doesn't have to state everything. It could state the principle behind something. And it could be teaching you the wisdom that is necessary for you to handle a specific situ situation or a technical situation. So the Quran does help you deal with life in that sense. Okay, so that's the first principle. So we're going to stop here and next week, inshallah, we'll move on to Al-Qa'idah Thaniya or the second principle, bi-idhnillah ta'ala. And we will give some examples on it as well. So now we move on to uh, the thematic commentary on the Quran. And again, I would say, as I said, I definitely rec recommend you guys get your own copy for this class on uh, of a translation of the meanings of the Quran. Get your own copy. If you can bring it here, it would be very helpful. And uh, I would prefer that you actually read I'm going to tell you what we will talk about, what the verses... And now we're just going to go over the surahs, so it's hard for you to go, like, cover 10 juz in a week, I understand. But once we take the second round over the Qur'an, we start going over... And probably, I was also thinking, by the way, I was questioning the speech. Shall we cover, um, as we said initially, each juz in two months? And then Brother Hassan made an announcement, and he just said, uh, juz a month. 
and actually I felt tempted that we could actually do a juz every month it's 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 quite it's quite actually doable it might be and I think it's actually m more conducive to the style of the class rather than us going into more details so we'd focus so let's say uh, yeah most likely we'll be able inshallah to cover one juz every month and I think that's that will uh, it will not take us to a great length where some people will feel a little bit bored or, or overwhelmed okay the the translation that I personally recommend you can take any translation of the meanings but the one I really recommend and I find it to be quite helpful and accessible to most people is uh, the clear Quran which is by Dr. Mustafa Khattab Imam of Masjid Anatolia here in Mississauga mashallah he did quite a good job may Allah reward him uh, there is different uh, prints of this book I prefer this one which has the Arabic and the English some of them have the English ones only the English text with the class a tafsir I would definitely recommend uh, Ibn Sa'di yeah Taysir al-Kareem al-Rahman the tafsir of Sheikh Ibn Sa'di Taysir al-Kareem al-Rahman and again, it's one of the books that you can find everywhere, almost everywhere, in Arabic. And I, as I said, it was translated in English. Uh, any tafsir that you can find as well, you have access to. You don't have to go and buy one. If you have one at home, you have access to one like a soft copy. Uh, still use it to follow. Use it to follow. Again, what we're we doing, we're doing a commentary. We're not doing a tafsir. We're not necessarily doing a tafsir. Okay. So a few points inshallah as we start So what I will do today We will start talking about the main central uh, verse in each surah And as I said this is an effort I've been trying to you know, work on for, for a while And uh, what I noticed from reading the, some of the commentary by some scholars About what the main theme in a surah is Sometimes they differ Sometimes they differ Why? Because you will find in Surah Al-Baqarah quite a lot of themes and a lot of them are strongly present in the surah. Let's say there's about five to six, uh, I would say, major themes in Surah Al-Baqarah. You will find them. So one scholar will pick one of them as the most dominant and then will link the other themes to it as branching out from it. So make it, take it as the reference point. Another scholar would take actually another one of those five main themes. And they, in their, in, in their estimate, this is actually the the most central in Surah Al-Baqarah and it sort of weaves everything together, threads everything together. So they take it as the central theme and the other ones as branching out of it and so on and so forth. So it's quite flexible. As I said, it's, it's a human effort but it's, it's extremely helpful. It's extremely helpful because it gives you a way, a framework to approach the Surah and see how it flows and how it's unified. Okay. So our class is a thematic commentary on the Qur'an. It's about the seamless flow of the divine wisdom. So these are guidelines the, about the Qur'an, Quranic text that we have to keep in mind as we are going through this uh, class. Uh, and these serve as foundational principles and as the guidelines that will help us organize our thoughts as we are going through you know the themes the main themes in the Quran so the Quran is the text of the Quran is purposeful there's a reason behind it there's a reason why everything is being said why every word is put there why this verse comes after th that verse and why there is a specific sequence of verses why the surahs are ordered in this specific way why some surah begins with a story then ends up you know breaking down the story why sometimes the principles are mentioned first and then the surah follows there are reasons so the quran is perfect so there's nothing random about the quran and this is extremely important why because it helps us know that there's intent behind this order and this organization so we search for it automatically when you know there is intent behind something you start try, you start searching for it but if you just think it's random hey surah al-baqarah just starts with okay dalikal kitab al arab fihi then mentions three types of people then it mentions uh, about you know people in jannah and people in the hellfire then it talks about uh, the story of the creation of adam 
they just happen to be like this. They just happen to be like this. No. This sequence is intentional. There is purpose behind it. It's purposeful. There is purpose. So what we try to do in this is actually try to get some of those purposes, try to arrive at some of those purposes. Number two is systematic. Systematic, it means it's very well connected, it's very well structured. So there's nothing random. There's, there's no like gap in the Quran, in, the, in a verse, or, or some kind of, a, of, a, of an abrupt jump. Even what seems to us uh, at a surface uh, or at a first glance as, 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 a, as a sudden change that might to some of us seem inappropriate, this is our own fault. We're not seeing the point. That kind of swift change, again, is purposeful and is part of a system. So when we know that, we try to see that system. We try to detect the patterns. It will help us. Three, the Quran is internally consistent. Meaning there's no contradictions. There is no contradictions. So that means when there is a seeming contradiction on the surface, okay, that means we have to do a little bit more hard work. We have not understood the point. That's what it means. And the Quran is internally consistent not only in what it suggests, in information. The Quran is consistent even in its themes. Themes are consistent. So a theme would support another theme. And a theme would uh, pave the ground for another theme. So it's consistent. And all these themes, you know, form one unity. That's the internal consistency. The Quran is cohesive. Cohesive in a sense, that's the flow of ideas. The flow of ideas. So the transitions of the Quran from one idea to the other, from one story to the other, and then coming back to a principle, then going back to a story, then coming back to the same principle, then speaking about some details that have to do with this principle. Okay, All of these actually show a beautiful state of cohesion and we are uh, you know, we're after this. We're going to chase that and we try to find it. We try to find the cohesion. All of these, by the way, are taken from one verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا If it were from other than Allah, which is the Quran, they would have found within it. اِخْتِلَافًا is one of the very comprehensive words in Arabic. اِخْتِلَاف means disorganization it means lack of fluency it means contradiction it means lack of cohesion cohesion and it also uh, stylistic inconsistencies so all of these come from this verse uh, the, the 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 next principle is the Quranic text is profound in its nature is profound in its nature so uh, oftentimes people who have uh, something negative to say about the Quran or about a verse in the Quran or about a meaning of the Quran most of the time their problem if like if you inspect that carefully you will find that it comes from lack of a profound understanding of what these verses are talking about so the Qur'an has a profound nature and we have to take it seriously. We have to take it seriously. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, says, again, uh, when Allah says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. Well, the surface meaning is basically, okay, when I don't know something about the religion, I ask people who have the knowledge and that's it. But if you take it more profound, at a more profound level, Allah is saying, ask the right people who have the knowledge and they can give you the guidance. Ahl al-Dhikr are not people of knowledge only. Ahl al-Dhikr are people of reminder, or people of the Qur'an. What does that mean? That means these are, these are people who, spent, who devoted their life to the Qur'an. So it's not only knowledge they have, but they have embodied the Qur'an. They have embodied Islam. These are the people you ask, because you're not only for after information. What you want is full guidance. And if the person does not embody that guidance, they cannot give you advice, by the way. It's just like when you go to a bad lawyer and they know all the uh, loopholes in the law, right? Okay? And uh, they basically, they're going to go against the law. 
They're going to go against the law. That's not people of the dhikr. These are not people of the dhikr. People of the dhikr are people who, like, they're, they're passion into something, their knowledge about something, and they are so faithful to that kind of field. So, again, so you take, take it deeper. Wow, that's profound. So that means in every area of my life, I go to the people who have mastered that kind of discipline or that area. These are the people that I go to. These are the people that I refer to. So it, it, the Quran is deep in its nature. Num, uh, the next principle is that it's natural. The Quran is natural. What does that mean? That has to do with our fitrah. The Quran addresses our nature, our human nature. So it resonates with us and we need to seek that resonance. We need to seek it. We need to find it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains the mechanism of guidance. Allah says in the Quran, فَمَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَهْدِيَهُ يَشْرَحْ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ Whoever Allah wants to guide him or her, if Allah wants to guide a person, Allah expands their chest for Islam. You know, the scholars when they talk about this, and some of them refer to the verse in Surah An-Nur, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about uh, light upon light. And the scholars say this is the light of the fitrah which is already in the heart that's almost shining by itself without being lit without a fire it's almost shiny by itself it's like the oil of the olive tree and that's the fitrah it, it, it's about to shine even without any fire and the fire here in this verse is, is it resembles the revelation because it's the source of light so the fitrah is almost shining and showing us the truth Almost, even without the need of revelation, but Allah still gave us the revelation. So, many scholars, when they spoke about expanding the chest, they said that's it when the human nature is there, when the human nature is addressed by this revelation. So, the Quran resonates with us, resonates with our human nature, and it awakens human nature. So, that in this, in this, in this sense, the Quran is natural. So, when we recognize the flow of the divine wisdom in the Quran, that will help us connect to the Qur'an at an organic level, at a natural level, rather than an intellectual level only. And that's the problem with many people when they study the Qur'an, for them it's intellectual thing. Okay, it's like they're studying mathematics or physics. The problem is that this does, this does not engage their hearts. For them it's, ac it's academic work. But we want to take the Qur'an at an academic level, but also at a deeper level, so it connects to our hearts, becomes more of a complete experience. More of a complete experience. And the last principle that we are going to have is that the Quran is complete. The Quran is a complete revelation. There's nothing missing and there's nothing uh, to be uh, complimented. Like you're not, there's nothing missing that you can complete and say, okay, we have to add this, we have to add that. The Qur Quran, this is the final version of the Quran and it's compatible and it's consistent, it's coherent and it flows beautifully and there is no element missing. The whole recipe is there. So we're going to keep these as guidelines inshallah as we move on. And here I want to start with Surah Al-Fatiha. So we're going to go over. So m my approach here in this halaqa will be to detect the, I would say, central verse, or I'm leaning towards calling it the foundational verse. And this verse harbors the central theme. I'm not going to say the themes now. I'm going to say, I'm going to say the themes. I, I will allude to the themes. I will allude to the, to the themes. I will state them. I will allude to the themes here. But I will state, uh, we will state the themes in the second round. After we're done, we've had the first go over the Quran. With the second one, inshallah, we're going to state the themes. Because we're going to work on them. <coughs> so Surah Al-Fatiha. The central verse is إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Oh Allah, it is you that we worship and it's your help that we seek. Everything in Surah Al-Baqarah feeds into this. Everything. This verse holds Surah Al-Baqarah together. Connects it together. Uh, Surah Al-Fatiha connects it together. This verse. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ So what's the theme? That's the central theme of Surah Al-Fatiha. Everything in it has to do with that. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen has to do with this. 
Rahman al-Rahim has to do with this. You can trace it back to this. Maliki Yawm al feeds into this and comes out of that. Same thing, Ihdina Salat al Mustaqim, everything. So if you understand that central theme, you've got sort of, uh, what is the word? I would say the, yeah, you, you've got the syrup of Surah Al-Hal. <laughs> the what? You, you ha- yes, you have the key, definitely, but you have the concentrated Surah Al-Fatiha, <laughs> so to speak. You have the concentration of Surah Al-Fatiha, here it is. Huh? The yog. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, you, yeah, you have, you, you have the concentrate and you can dilute it later on <laughs> as you study it. Okay, so that's Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Baqarah. Surah Al-Baqarah, which is the longest surah in the Quran. The central verse or the foundational verse in Surah Al-Baqarah. There's a mistake as I'm writing it. As I wrote, I wrote it with Ba, it's Ya, yeah, okay. Ya ayyuhan nasu abudu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum waladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun. I'm, I'm going to be using this, as I said, this translation. Uh, and this is verse number 21 in Surah Al-Baqarah. Verse number 1 in Surah Al-Baqarah. Everything in Surah Al-Baqarah is an explanation on this. Everything. Whether it's themes or whether singular verses or stories. The explanation of this of this verse. So verse number 21, the translation of the meanings, O humanity, Allah is addressing all of humans. So Surah Al-Baqarah in this sense is what? Is an address from Allah to humanity. Allah is speaking to him as a message to humanity. <clears throat> Worship your Lord. Worship and your Lord who created you and those before you, those who, who came before you, so that you may become you might have taqwa, mindful of him. He, he, it's translated here mindful, but taqwa. Taqwa is more. Everything in Surah Al-Baqarah has to do with this. Everything. So it's an address to humanity. It's to everyone. So if you want someone, if someone wants to know about Islam and about what Allah wants from people in Islam, they better read Surah Al-Baqarah. Yeah. They better read Surah Al-Baqarah. If a Muslim wants to know how to worship Allah, أُعْبُدُوا Rabbakum, Worship your Lord. They better go over Surah Al-Baqarah. Understand it carefully. And they will know how to worship Allah. Rabbakum. If you want to know why you should worship Allah, you better go to Surah Al-Baqarah because Allah gives you enough reasons in Surah Al-Baqarah why you should worship, and worship Him. And that's coded in the word Rabbakum, your Lord. Right. If you want to know the meaning of worship, it's in Surah Al-Baqarah. Or the meaning of ibadah, it's in Surah Al-Baqarah. Khalaqakum, created you, so it's addressed to you, and those who came before you, humanity, are under the same obligation. They share the same lineage, the same ancestry, the same fate, and the same experience. Those who came before you, it's the same experience. So you have a connection to the people who came before, and you have so much to learn from that human history. Keep that in mind. Human history. Though you and those who came before you shared human history. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may arrive at taqwa. What is taqwa? We want to know what taqwa means. Surah Al-Baqarah tells you in detail what taqwa means. We're going to break it down from Surah Al-Baqarah. And also there is a hidden uh, theme here which is basically states of being like taqwa are earned they cause and effect in terms of behavior so in a sense you control your destiny Allah is saying you want to have taqwa you do this so it's not about fate it's not we have freedom of choice and our actions and our decisions are consequential. All of that is in Surah Al-Baqarah, by the way, clearly. We're going to come to see. Okay? 
So that's Surah Al-Baqarah. Let's move on to Surah Ali Imran. Uh, shall I give you a test to guess? Who would like to guess Surah Ali Imran? Surah Ali Imran, I found it to be very difficult to arrive at something. Scholars who've tried to talk about the intent of Surah Ali Imran actually gave different answers. But if you, again, this is the principle of profound. Try to dig deeper. Always dig deeper. You can actually connect them. Um, Surah Ali Imran, does anyone would like to give a try? I'll say this is one of the main themes, which is the last verse in Surah Ali Imran. It's one of the one of the main themes, but I personally could not see how everything else in Surah Al Baqarah branches out of this. That was my issue with sabr and patience. Anyone would like to give it a try? So, inshallah, as as we go over the surahs, like in the second round, when we go a little bit in more details, that's why it's important to do your your homework. If you read what we are going to cover. We will have some questions, we'll have a discussion. And that's extremely helpful for us to understand, by the way, and learn. It enhances our learning experience. So if you do that, it will be very helpful. Murad. Qul in kuntum Allah. Say, if you love Allah, then follow me. This is a bit too general to be a theme. I could connect this to everything in the Quran, not only Surah Ali Imran, you see? So sometimes you could, we could go too global, which is too general. Um, and that would not help. So we could, get, we could give something too general and it could connect to everything, but we would lose the, what is, spe, what is special about this surah? So we have to narrow it down, go a little bit high resolution, but not too much. Because if you go high resolution, if you go 4K, man, it's going to be too specific. It's going to be too specific, which is like Asmiru wa Sabiru, the verse. It's just too specific. Some of the other themes in the surah will be, have to be excluded. So we want to, find the sweet spot in the middle where there is something that is general enough and is not too specific okay so it does not become too general uh, so we lose what is special about the surah and it does not become too specific where we lose the main theme of the surah the okay let's find out وَاَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Okay. Yeah, which is uh, <coughs> verse number 103. وَاَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا وَاذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَا حُفْرَةٍ مِنَ النَّارِ فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ مِنْهَا كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ آيَاتِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَهْتَدُونَ This includes patience by the way and it's definitely part of loving Allah, right? But let's, let's just go over this verse again since it's the... So I'm not going to state the central theme, but I'm going to give a lot of hints about it. So I'm going to read the uh, me, uh, translation of the meanings. And hold firmly to the rope of Allah. Everything in the surah, by the way, is about this. Okay. And do not be divided. There's so much about division over there in Surah Ali Imran. And remember Allah's favor upon you when you were enemies. The favor of Allah in Islam, which is, which is Islam itself, right? You were enemies. So Allah gave you two things by means of Islam. Allah brought your hearts together, right? And brought unity among you. So you were enemies, then He united your hearts. So you, by His grace, became brothers. Quran, uh, Surah Ali Imran talks a lot about this and the importance of this. And uh, and you were at the at the brink of a fiery pit, and he saved you from it. So there is issue about Muslim relationships together, Muslim to Muslim brotherhood, and there's an issue of the your your state of guidance, religious state, and the social state. And 
the religious state and the state of the Muslims these are the, these are the two sub themes of Surah Ali Imran Surah Ali Imran talks about this and talks about that they actually take 90% of the surah these two themes okay <clears throat> And thus, uh, uh, Allah makes His revelation clear to you so that you may be rightly guided. Clarification of the guidance, okay, and all the, the verses and signs of Allah, and guidance. So, guidance and wa'tasimu, they actually they contain within themselves what all of Surah Ali Imran is I'tisam al hidayah I'tisam and hidayah I'tisam and hidayah okay by far this is the central like foundational verse in Surah Ali Imran by far like there's no rival to it okay Surah Al Nisa what do you think the central verse or the foundational verse in Surah Al Nisa is sometimes you will find it in the middle sometimes you'll find it at the beginning sometimes towards the end sometimes you have a few verses rivaling over which one and it's difficult to choose yes yes Surah An-Nisa the first verse and then the whole surah branches out of it Ya أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ اتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمْ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ so it's about humanity humans okay it talks about taqwa which we had in surah al-baqarah and rabbakum your lord who created you from one single soul one single so you all came from the same person social connections you all belong to the same family okay but then okay there's other issues with the family even the spouse of that soul came from it right so that shows the connection between humans and the closeness and then husband and wife and everything that has to do with them humanity men and women came from that right so nations other nations and tribes and so on and so forth how they connect what's the relationship how to deal with them reminder of humans you know all being the same race right men and women Allah didn't say just people men and women issues of men and women how they relate to each other all of them are there and all of that is done within the context of taqwa fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being mindful of him and dutiful to him what taqwa Allah again taqwa is again so that shows your devotion to Allah that you ask through Allah and you ask of Allah والأرحام. you seek nearness to Allah and you seek your needs to be fulfilled through your being dutiful to your kins to your relations being dutiful again relations Allah is a watcher over you okay I give so many hints so many hints okay Let's move on to next surah. Surat. Let me see. Surat al Maida. Surat al Maida has a name, by the way. Like uh, companions, Allah Allah used to call Surat al Maida or Surat. Who knows? Al Uqud. Agreements. Surah of agreements. The first bit or the first verse, Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu awfu bil uqud. O you believers, O you who believe, honor your obligations. Al uqud is not obligations. So al uqud are your agreements, your covenants. And that means your transactional covenants and agreements, business, transactions, rent sales whatever services employment honor them social agreement which is not necessarily not necessarily explicit there is social contract social contract is extremely important and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us with al-ma'roof what is known what is accepted in society as long as it does not go against Islam 
because going against the norm of a society disrupts it creates a lot of trouble and a lot of issues create troubles for you and for others and will lead to grave consequences going against the norms of a society as long as they are not against Islam by the way is playing with fire many people don't realize this even with smaller issues by the way because people have a social contract I expect you to behave in a certain way even though I don't know you I've never met you I expect you to behave in a certain way you're I can figure you out to a great extent that I'm safe and I can deal with you we have some common grounds I feel safe and that that makes socialization and transactions and dealings and everything that makes life go smoothly but when someone is not bound by the social contract by the way we go to survival mode we don't know what we're dealing with so it's, so people freak out that's why by the way sometimes and I understand sometimes uh, there is racism in every society but sometimes we we overuse that sometimes just people generally speaking reject what's 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 different and they're scared of it it's a natural human reaction and then we label it as racism so so sometimes you just have to understand human nature that's why the prophet for example the nahar sallam and libas al-shuhra the prophet sallam prevented and prohibited a, per, a person to wear or to dress up in a way that is different from the people different from the masses so uh, how do how do you know that someone is not gonna grab your tablet and smash it against the wall how do you know that do you have any guarantee no but there's a social contract it's inappropriate behavior it's your property right that's the social contract again there's a natural contract we have a natural intuitive contract the fitri contract with Allah Surah Al-Ma'idah talks about all of this talks about human business transactional contracts talks about the social contract talks about our natural fitra contract with Allah and talks about our conscious uh, commitment to Islam as another type of contract that's what Surah Al-Ma'idah talks about and then it talks about other nations and their contract so uh, the verse or the story of al-ma'idah is actually about this it's about the contract staying and so on and so forth we'll come to see even hajj is mentioned there there's a contract there so we're going to talk about this um can take one more surah surat al huh? yeah i'm not saying themes i said i'll just mention the verse and i'll give hints these themes we're gonna go over the Quran like this in this quick fashion probably maybe I'll say three inshallah three weeks should be enough then once we're done with Surah Al-Nas we'll go back to Surah Al-Fatiha then start dealing more at a depth but inshallah and I'm leaning more towards this every month we'll finish a juz Surah Al-An'am gave me a lot of hard time really like and I couldn't figure out the central theme and I read here and read there and I they didn't come together from different scholars they didn't come together um, but the first verse Alhamdulillah Alladhi khalaq as-samawati wal-arda wa ja'ala al-dhulumati wal-nur thumma alladhina kafaru bi rabbihim ya'dilun let me see how it's translated here the meanings all praises for Allah who created the heavens and the earth and made darkness and light Yet the disbelievers set up equals to their Lord in worship. The Arabic is very profound, honestly. Alhamdulillah. It means Allah is complete, is perfect. And He deserves all the best. And He does everything that is just right. Uh, he's the one who created the heavens and the earth. That's His rububiyyah, His Lordship. He's the Lord. And He made the darkness and the night. And all of these have literal meanings. And they have symbolic meanings. Alright? They have symbolic meanings. Then the disbelievers make equals to their Lord. What does it talk about? It talks about Allah, who Allah is. Allah talks about Himself in a beautiful way in Surah Al An'am, like no other Surah. So most of the Surah is just about Allah, a description of Allah. Even Allah says, rabbukum la ilaha illa huwa fa'budu. It's a profound verse in Surah Al-An'am. This is your Lord. After the description of Allah, Allah says, This is your Lord. No one is worthy of worship but Him, so worship Him. 
That's a beautiful, profound. Allah speaks about Himself and introduces Himself to us in detail. And He shows that He is the only one who deserves to be worshipped, no equals. And then He talks about how equals and equals are attributed to Him and so on and so forth. Then He goes into details about prayer and about slaughtering animals and about how to deal with animals and about legislation and how this has to do with Allah Himself and the rights of Allah. Uh, Al-An'am. Okay, shall we take one more? Al-A'raf? Al-A'raf gave me a hard time. Anyone can figure out Al-A'raf? <laughs> really gave me some tough time, Al-A'raf. Because it's quite diverse. It is quite diverse. Al-A'raf. Al-A'raf. No one wants to give it a try? It's verse number two. ألف لام يم صاد كتاب أنزل إليك فلا يكن في صدرك حرج منه لتنذر به وذكرى للمؤمنين. This is a book or a book that was sent down to you, O Prophet. Do not let anxiety into your heart regarding it, so that. Yeah, so that you may warn the disbelievers and as a reminder to the believers. Surah Al-Araf is about the book. It's about the book of Allah and how to deal with it. Okay? And how to warn with it. And how it serves as a reminder. Then it talks about how people, different people deal with the book and what's going to happen to them based on that. Okay, let's stop here. Uh, yeah, Maghrib is in about five minutes, six minutes. Okay, so we'll stop here, inshallah. Uh, next week, uh, hopefully, we'll cover quite a, a, a good number of surahs with the central verses, or I would say the foundational verse in every surah. And this should give a good journey, quick trip or journey through the Quran before we uh, take a more in depth one over the central themes and the main themes in, in, uh, through the Qur'an. And throughout this, inshallah, I'll be sharing some quotes from some scholars about this, about the, you know, the methodology that we are following. So we're going to stop here. I can take one or two questions before we close. Any questions? So, okay, uh, just, uh, just remind you, uh, it's it's good again. You can follow at Tafsir as we are moving along. Inshallah, this will help you pace your uh, research, and uh, uh, preferably have uh, I would say have the translation at least have the translation of the meanings of the Quran, and follow with us. And when I give you homework to read, it will help us a lot during the halqa. Inshallah, and it will help us keep going according to a reasonable pace that is suitable, hopefully, to everyone. Um, and again, if you want to follow. Another level, if you want to follow with uh, Al Qawaid Al Hisan by Sheikh Ibn, Ibn Sa'di on the principles of the tafsir of the Quran, then we'll be going over this slowly. So our halqa has two segments. Um, and then at some point, inshallah, we will merge both of them and you will see how the, the principles help us understand the, the themes of the, of the Quran. Yeah, and that's it, inshallah. Well, yeah. So, questions again? Yeah. Is this a puzzle? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I see why the puzzle was there. So this is uh, okay. Yeah, the the verse says, "Wa'tasimu." Hold on to the rope of Allah and be united. 
without this, there's no unity. And if there's any unity without holding on to the rope of Allah, it's not the unity Allah talks about. Let's put the verse a little bit on the side here and go to your question. Your question is a fiqhi question. Second line when it starts in the jama'ah, where does it start? From behind the imam. Yeah, some people are un, uh, have the understanding that they should start on the far right, but that's not, you know, you don't want to be with the far right or the far left. Yeah, be in the middle. <laughs> be in the middle. It's politically safe. Be in the middle, start where the imam starts. That's really where the line starts. Yeah. Why? Yeah. The central what? Come from? Oh yeah, okay. That's a good question. A central theme in a surah, is it only in one verse? Well, that's why it's central. It's everywhere. You can trace it back everywhere. That's why it's central. Because if you can't trace it any... Like even let's say in 30% of the verses you can't trace it, then it's probably not central. Right? But yes, there is a verse that sort of harbors uh, the most intense expression of this central theme and that's what we call the foundational verse in the surah. Okay? So we search for that verse. But sometimes it might be difficult to find one verse that is quite like expressive of the theme or gives a very good idea of the theme. So then we might use two verses in that case. But I haven't got to that point yet. Okay. Khair, inshallah. Okay. Jazakumullah khairan. And see you inshallah next week. 7.30 again. Jazakumullah khairan. I saw a lot of the brothers, mashallah, jazakumullah khairan, made the effort to come early. May Allah reward you. That's a great improvement. And inshallah will help, help us with the class. And I said, uh, I'm taking this endeavor seriously. So inshallah, let's put our hearts and hard work in it. Jazakumullah khair. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Every Friday at 7.30 bi idhnillah ta'ala. And we will let you know if there is an interruption or there is a special event. We'll let you know the week before bi idhnillah.